Thank you for traveling for two hours early in the morning to come and be here this morning. St. Francis Cabrini chose this place for you. She came up here herself in 1899 by horse and buggy. She probably came along the same road that you drove along, but it was a dirt, a dirt road back then. This was originally chosen as a novitiate and a sort of um, resting place for new orphans while they were assigned to a specific monastery, a specific orphanage. And when you walked in under the big trees, you probably walked under a tree that a saint stood in the shade of once a long time ago. And now you're here today because of her. I'm going to tell you, oh, first I'll tell you who I am. My name is Sherry Sprosty. I am the proud daughter of immigrants. My father is from Bohemia, the Czech Republic, and my mother's family is from Ireland. I am the director of spiritual programs for Cabrini Shrine. I am a married lady with three grown children. I am not a missionary sister of the Sacred Heart. This is, of course, the home of the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart, Mother Cabrini's order, and several of the sisters live here in the convent. St. Francis Cabrini was born, of course, in Italy, in Sant'Angelo di Giano, and that was in 1850. She was the daughter of very devout, very happy Catholic parents, and it was not a big town, but it was a pretty, fairly prosperous town. And every evening, her father would read to the family about the missions. At that time, there was a real fervor in their area of northern Italy for missionary work and a real promotion of devotion to the Sacred Heart. Cabrini was the youngest of 13 children. She was born premature, so she was uh, very frail her whole life. Um, there was some concern whether she would live through the first few days, so she was actually rushed over to the church and baptized the same day that she was born. Only three of the children in the family survived into adulthood, so it was a rough time back then. There was a, uh, an outbreak of smallpox during her younger years and uh, a lot of privation, some famine, some real problems. She grew up as the youngest child, she was mothered by her older sister, Rosa. And if you look at the mosaic behind me, the sisters had this put in as a teaching aid. And you can see here she is with her sister, Rosa. And Rosa was a teacher, and Cabrini grew up under her rather stern spiritual guidance. But she, she learned discipline, and she learned her faith very well from her sister. Up above, you can see she's kneeling. This would have been when she was eight years old and received her first communion. She rarely talked about peak spiritual moments in her life. She was very private about those experiences. But the one thing that we do have from her letters is that for her, that moment of her first communion was pivotal. It was tremendously important to her. She became aware of the enormity of God's love and care for her. And she found herself uniquely and intimately joined to the love of Jesus Christ in that moment. That was something that carried her through her whole life. She was always one of those, you know the little kids, the ones who just, they know all about God. They have that simple open spirit and that wonderful spirituality. And if you ask them questions about God, they come up with these surprising answers. She was one of those kids. As she was growing up, that, that idea of being a missionary really caught fire with her. Those were the adventure stories. She particularly loved the stories of China, and her father would read to her about China, and that was her dream. So she would make little paper boats, and she would put violets in them. If you walk out through the hallway, you'll see we have a whole, we have a whole windowsill full of plants, violets, that we use for celebrations when they happen to bloom at the same time. She put the, put the boat, boat in the water and then float it down and say, there go my missionaries off to China. She was doing that one day at her uncle's house, and the brook was a lot deeper on his property. She leaned way out and bloop, there she went, head over heels into the rushing water. And somebody grabbed her by the back of her little pinafore and they yanked her out and dumped her on the bank and she just kind of lay back gasping and shook herself and looked around and nobody was there. And the sisters like to say that her guardian angel pulled her out of the water. So she grew and eventually she went to school to be a teacher. 
she was beloved in her local school. She taught in the local school. And eventually word came to the bishop of her extraordinary leadership skills and her energy. And she was asked to run an orphanage in a nearby town. It was a diocesan orphanage run by two other women who just didn't really have the knack for an organization that Cabrini did. So she came. And at the time, there were five young women there who felt they had a vocation to the religious life. So that's where the first idea of being a religious sister was really nurtured and really grew for St. Francis Cabrini. Soon she had the place in shipshape order. The children were having healthier food, funds were being raised, they were being, being used appropriately, and the vocation of those five sisters and Cabrini grew and grew. Eventually, however, the kids didn't need the orphanage, the community didn't need the orphanage, and so Cabrini was allowed to take her sisters and form her own order, the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now, I've heard a story that she went to the local bishop and said, Bishop, Your Excellency, here is our rule, and we've all organized the order this way, and we would like your permission to be declared uh, officially a religious order. We want to be the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And he said, oh, oh, the sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, that's lovely, yes, you can do that. She said, oh, excuse me, the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And he said, oh, no, 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 women can't be missionaries. Well, as you can see, the name of the order is the missionary sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We don't know what that conversation was, but she had a very strong will and a very clear vision of what Jesus had called her to do. And that's what she aimed her whole life at, was, was following that call that she felt Jesus had given her back when she received her first communion to live in his love and to spread that love to people all over the world as a missionary. She never forgot her dream of going to China. And in 1888, she and her sisters went to the Vatican to speak with Pope Leo. And he had heard of her, and she, she came with some pretty good publicity. He had a good opinion of her. And when she said, Your Holiness, we are ready, the order's organized, we would like to go to China, he said, no, not to the east, but to the west. And he sent her and her sisters here to New York City, where they arrived in 1889. The city that the sisters arrived in was in turmoil down on the Lower East Side. And if you know your history of Catholicism in New York City, I see you shaking your heads. How many of you are children of Italian immigrants? Oh, welcome home. Wonderful. Um, so you can correct me later if I get any of this wrong. I'll give you my best version. But we had about 50,000 Italian immigrants living in New York City at the time who were victims of the political upheaval that was happening at that time in Italy. And these were mostly Southern Italians. There were some more prosperous and more educated Northern Italians who also came here, but the majority of the ones who really, really needed help, they were, they were farm folk, they were rural people, and they couldn't read, and they couldn't communicate their needs to anyone here in the city. So they wound up down there, and if you go down, you visit the, the Tenement Museum, you can see the kind of places they lived in. It's a fantastic experience, I recommend it. Um, they were living in these five and six story brick tenements. There was not much circulation in the buildings. This was before those health laws about having you know, fresh air coming through. There were no bathrooms or running water in the buildings. So to use the restroom, you went outside to a privy that you shared with the whole building. To get water, you went outside to the one pump and you carried buckets up to your place to wash. If you wanted to do laundry, it was even more complicated. So these folks would come to Mass on Sunday with their smelly clothes and dirty selves because they didn't have any way to care for themselves, speaking Italian and looking different from the Irish people, my people, who were running the church at that time in New York. They were generally made to stand outside. They couldn't pray in their own language, and they were losing their faith because there was no one there to catechize their children. 
and no one there to, to give them the sacraments and the Eucharist. So the Pope was seriously, seriously concerned about this. And Bishop Corrigan, who was the bishop that, at that time, was as well, and he actually asked the Pope to send some help. So this was the environment that the sisters landed in. Unfortunately, they got there too fast. They arrived, I think 30 days after they spoke to Pope Leo with their suitcases and knocked on the door of the, of the, uh, the bishop and they said, we're here, we're ready. And he said, no, 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 go home. We're not ready for you. We don't have a convent for you. You missed my letter, it must have passed you on the boat ride. And she said, no, we will stay. The Holy Father sent us and we're going to get busy. Luckily, they were allowed to room with another order of sisters who first thing took one look at these little Italian nuns in their black dresses and their black bonnets. And they said, the bonnets aren't gonna wash here. This is not gonna work. No one will believe you're a sister in a black bonnet and a dress. They'll think you're an Italian widow. So the first thing they had to do was come up with a veil. And if you see the pictures, you can see up here a little bit, she has a bow under her chin. So that was the old habit. And it would have been just a very simple dress, black dress or a skirt, skirt and a black blouse with a little button with a bonnet with a little ruffle around the head. And they would take the black veil and then just pin it on the top. She really wanted these to be practical habits that the women could work in. So there were no rosaries or big things hanging off of them. They, she sewed a little pocket in for their rosary, which they always had with them tucked away. So they're in New York City. They first established orphanages for the kids down on the Lower East Side. The first day they were in the neighborhood, they walked around and they collected food for the poor, from the poor, and shared it with the poor. They also put word out that on Sunday, after the last Mass at St. Joachim's Parish, down here on the, on the Lower East Side, the pastor was going to let them teach catechism. And any child who wanted to hear about their faith in Italian was supposed to come over after the last Mass. Father figured they might have 50 or 60 children come. There were 350 children and adults in the church that day, and their ministry of education and catechesis in the faith began that day in the United States. The next thing that happened that was interesting, Archbishop Corrigan asked the sisters if they would run a hospital, Christopher Columbus Hospital at uh, 109th Street here in Manhattan. And Cabrini said, I'm sorry, I, I do orphanages, I do schools, I'm an educator, I don't know the first thing about hospitals, I'm afraid you don't have the right person for this. Well, she went home, and she went to sleep. And you know when you have one of those dreams, maybe about your grandmother or someone who's gone before you, and it's, you can smell the smells in the room, you can feel the air, and it's, it's visceral, it's like a vision. She was in a hospital ward. And as she looked down this long ward, there were beds on either side. And she looked way in the corner of the ward, and there was a woman in a blue dress with a blue veil bending over a man's bed, and she was tucking the covers up around him. And she gathered up an armload of dirty linens, and she turned to leave, and Cabrini in her dream said, Blessed Mother, why are you doing this work? And Mary turned and looked at her and said, Someone has to do it. So Cabrini went to the bishop the next day and said, Yes, yes, God will help us find a way to do this. Her motto was, I can do all things in him who strengthens me, from Philippians. She truly, truly lived that motto. She placed all her faith in God. She figured if God wanted her to accomplish something, God would find a way for it to happen. So the hospital was established. Time and time again, this little thing, especially it happened with donations or money or support for the work of the Institute on the behalf of the poor and the immigrants. Um, there was a time early on when Cabrini, Mother Cabrini was in her uh, little sitting room meeting with a local Monsignor, and I'm sure she was trying to get him to help her, her students in some way or another. And the sister who was on duty in the kitchen ran through and she said, Mother, the baker's here. We don't have the money to pay the bill for the bread. And Mother Cabrini said, well, go, go in the kitchen. Go look in that drawer in the middle of the kitchen table. 
And the sister ran and looked. She said, it's empty. There's, there's nothing. We have no money. She said, go look again. She went and looked again, opened the drawer. It was the exact amount needed for the baker's bill. Who knows? When the sisters needed to expand their orphanage upriver into cleaner air and water, they were looking at Manresa, which at that time was a Jesuit retreat house. The Jesuits loved the area because it was very beautiful looking out over the Hudson with the, the high bluffs, but it did not have a reliable source of fresh water. So they sold it to Mother Cabrini for a song. And apparently she was a very effective deal maker. She then walked the grounds and walked a little bit of the neighbor's grounds and she looked around and poked around. She found a spring. She bought that piece of land from the neighbor and they used that water to this day up at West Park, which is the novitiate where the sisters are today. Um, they still use that source of fresh water. This began her travels. She worked her way all the way across the United States, down into New Orleans, and of course New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and into Chicago, uh, up into Seattle, down into Los Angeles. I'm gonna, if I have time, I'll read you a little passage from her book um, that's, it's in the gift shop. I'm only plugging it because I love it so much. It's from her uh, travel letters, so it's her words. And she talks about Los Angeles and it's such a pretty city and how she thinks you could grow just about anything there and it reminds her of Italy. So she, she loved the United States. All right, in 1909, she became a naturalized citizen of the United States. She did this mainly because she wanted to incorporate the business holdings of the order so that they were secure and they would continue in their ministry and so that she could do her real estate work. Someone gave her a silver mine and she used that for a while to, uh, to support the work in Denver. She was a very creative thinker. When um, her cause for canonization came up, the devil's advocate, whose job it is to be a skeptic, said, no, she's simply a good businesswoman. She's simply very good, very organized. But his opinion couldn't hold when it faced the miracles and the beautiful faith that all of her work came from. She went from the United States down into Central America and South America, Panama, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, she crossed the Andes on a mule. And here's the part I'm gonna to read to you, I love this. These were the Corrieros, it was between Chile and Argentina. And if you've ever seen a National Geographic special about that part of the world, they're pointy. They're really tall, tall, tall mountains covered with snow year round. And she and one of her sisters were there. There was a, it was a long caravan of folks on mules. And to honor them, the muleteers said, oh, sisters, you can ride first. So, so they put Mother Cabrini at the head of the line, of course, behind the guide. But so she's at the head of the line, and they're breaking through all this snow. And let me tell you about it, in her words. I would try to keep my mule from getting too close to the edges of certain precipices, several kilometers deep, over which we often found ourselves, but the poor animal, who knew she had an inexperienced rider, would not obey me and kept going straight no matter how hard I tried to pull either to the right or the left. At times, she would hang her head and neck over the side of the precipice, and I would yell at her and try talking to her in Spanish, but to no avail. The only way she would obey was if I acted as if, as if I was about to get off. That was the only thing that seemed to displease her. So they keep going. She talks about how they kept advancing and climbing higher and higher and higher, and the snow was all around them. On the other side, more very high peaks awaited us, and in front of us was the crevice. Like a long, deep, well-prepared opening, it stood ready to bury the whole caravan. As you have already heard, I was the first in line and wanted to be the first also here even to encourage the rest, because to tell the truth, I felt peaceful and without the slightest fear. My guide was already holding a long staff with a pointed end to brace himself for the leap across. 
thinking he would have to carry me across. When he offered himself, I said, oh, no, no, my good man, I can jump even farther than that. I'll cross by myself. Uh, he respectfully offered little resistance and watched closely, prepared to help, but understanding from experience that I would not have permitted it. I jumped, thinking it would be easy, as usual. Instead, because of the cold and the thin air that had depleted my strength, I saw too late that my leap was like that of a feather, which does not go far, no matter how hard it is thrown. I would have certainly been buried alive if my good guide truly a Saint Joseph, had not thrown himself quickly on the ground and stretched his body across the fissure, stopping my fall with his back on the edge of the other side. Afterward, with the help of his staff, he stood erect and pulled me by the arms to safety, where all that I had undergone caused strong palpitations in me, so strong I thought I'd die. So she wound up laying in a snowbank until she caught her breath, and then she got back on her mule, and they went along saying the rosary as they travel. She crossed the um, Andes, like I said. She went back and forth across the country by train, by horse, by wagon. She crossed the Atlantic Ocean 23 times. And this from who, a woman who as a child was a, really afraid of the water from her first experience with it. She moved into France, Italy, Germany, England, and she established more schools, orphanages, and hospitals there as well. In all, during her lifetime, she personally took a group of sisters and established 67 hospitals, orphanages, and schools. A remarkable thing, given that her career, this part of her career, was only 37 years long. She died in Chicago in 1917, in fact, in a couple of weeks, we will be celebrating the beginning of a centennial year celebration of her work. She died in Chicago. She had probably contracted malaria during her travels in Central America, and they surmise that it was the effects of long-term effects of malaria that took her life with a heart attack. Of course, the sisters were devastated at her loss. But she had done such a good job of organizing the order that they went on with her work beautifully. She was buried up at West Park. And in 1922, something happened here in New York City. A baby was born, Peter Smith, in Christopher Columbus Hospital. And at that time, the nurses would put silver iodide drops in the baby's eyes to prevent infection. And that's a really, really strong chemical. It'll eat through the paint on the pew in its full strength form. And that's what she grabbed, was the full strength form. Immediately, the child started to scream. His eyes went all red and swelled, swelled. And she ran that baby to the doctor, who did everything he could immediately. But he, he told the nurse, he said, his corneas are burned away. This child will be blind for the rest of his life. And the little guy also got some secondary infections very quickly. The doctor kept visiting and visiting, but the eyes were swollen shut. They were, they were sightless. The third day they came in, the doctor bent over the crib, and that baby looked up at him and met his gaze with two bright blue eyes. He was healed. There was no reason why he should have healed like that. It truly was a miracle. Around that time also, in Seattle, Sister Delphina was one of the sisters who um, had worked there for many years, and she was in her final hour. She was dying of cancer. It was uh, probably a colon cancer, a stomach cancer. She couldn't eat. She was very thin and frail and confined to her bed. She had a vivid dream where Cabrini walked into the room looked down at her in the bed and said, what are you doing there? Get up, you have work to do. And then she walked out the door. Sister Delphina blinked and opened her eyes and took a deep breath, and she felt pretty good. And she sat up in her bed, swung her feet over and called the sisters, and they were astonished. The next day, she wanted something to eat, and she went on to live 14 more years 
and do the work of the order. In 1938, Mother Cabrini began her process of uh, her journey towards sainthood with beatification. And these two miracles were put forth as proof of her holiness. Her, her canonization was approved in 1944, which is really fast when you think about it. Um, in those days, it generally took enough time, and it took enough time that everybody who knew you was dead, but there were live witnesses who could talk about her work in this case. She was canonized after the war in 1946, and there was quite a party out here. We found some old video footage of uh, people all lining the street up here, and uh, Bishop Corrigan, not Bishop Corrigan, um, oh, famous bishop, one of you will be able to tell me who this was. It would have been 1946. And he came here and celebrated a mass in the chapel of the high school. And at that time, the high school for girls was still running. The girls all lined up and they sang in the choir and their band was there. It was a huge celebration here in the neighborhood because they had their own saint. Well, of course, with a saint in the chapel and this little golden casket would have been in the altar over there in the school, there was no peace and quiet for the students. So the sisters decided to have this beautiful chapel built starting in 1958. And in 1959, Mother Cabrini's remains were moved here to Cabrini Shrine. What you see here in front of you, her remains, her bones are sealed and inside. There's a little framework for her habit and it's a little wax face with prosthetic hands. Her hands were created by, I understand, a Jewish man who himself was also an immigrant and really poured his heart into his work. So when you approach, that is what you're seeing. Okay, the last thing I want to read to you almost sounds like it was written just for us here in our time in 2016. And it speaks of her spirituality and how we can use it in our own lives. I know that this is a time of much anxiety. But away with anxiety. Take courage. You have done your duty. Place your trust in God and his Holy Mother. I need not encourage you to pray. I know that you pray with all your being. This comforts me because prayer is that powerful weapon that must defend and help you, not only now, but throughout your lives. It is the key to heavenly treasures, the channel through which graces descend. As long as you pray, you will be safe. In time of success, pray, and you will not be swollen by the pride that often precedes a fall. In times of discouragement, pray, and the trust that makes us strong with the strength of God will return. Pray for yourselves, for the persons entrusted to your care, for those dear to you, for society, for the church. Make prayer a habit because if you succeed in experiencing the sweetness found in this intimate conversation of the soul with God, there will never be hours of discouragement and despair, nor will clouds long disturb the calm horizon of your souls. You can tell she spent a lot of time on the ocean, the calm horizon of your souls. So I leave that with you as encouragement um, those words are up on our Facebook page, too, if you want to look on there and copy those for your own prayer.